to Bible Overview. Having established the purpose of this work in the previous chapter, our attention now turns to establishing the groundwork upon which future chapters will build. The Lord Jesus Christ clearly identified the foundational principles involved in methodical Bible study. In one instance, he pointed to three distinct divisions, calling them the Law, Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. That's found in Luke 24, 44, written in the Law of Moses, and in the Prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. Christ referred to these three divisions within the Scriptures. It is important to note that his referencing these three divisions helps visualize the fact that God intended for the body of Scripture to be divided. Yet even these three simple divisions do not cover the entirety of the Old Testament. These designations simply illustrate that the Scriptures can be, and should be, divided into parts because of the need for methodical Bible study. Word of Caution Dividing the scripture into sections can become quite complex with its own unique set of potential pitfalls. For example, the last 17 books of the Old Testament, Isaiah through Malachi, present a prominent prophetic emphasis. This does not exclude other books from containing prophecy. In fact, prophecy can be traced all the way back to the opening chapters of Genesis. Genesis 3.15. Additionally, the book of Psalms contains an extensive amount of prophecy. These truths are important to note since the Lord Jesus Christ declared that all scripture, meaning the entirety of the Old Testament, testified or prophesied of him. In fact, Jesus frequently spoke of the existing Old Testament scriptures as prophesying events in his day. Along with the example from Luke chapter 24 mentioned earlier, here is another example. In John 5, 39, Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Unlike the charts from the previous chapter, the next few charts are not intended to illustrate any type of timeline. Instead, these charts serve as a basic overview of the divisions of the books of the Bible as found in the Old and New Testaments. Take note, that these are not intended to be hard, fast divisions, but reflect the primary emphasis of the specific contents within each division. The chart on page 38 is titled Basic Book Divisions 1, Old Testament. The Old Testament Book Divisions, Section A, The Pentateuch, Five Books, Genesis through Deuteronomy, primarily covering 2,500 years from the creation of man to the death of Moses. After detailing God's creative work, focus almost immediately shifts to God's dealings with the first couple in the Garden of Eden. The Pentateuch time period ends with God focused upon one nation wandering through the wilderness. Section B, History, 12 books, Joshua through Esther, covering nearly a thousand year period, reflecting an emphasis on Israel's historical record. This record begins with the initial conquest of Canaan and ends with the Jews scattered, some into captivity while others remain in the land of promise. This section chronicles the rise of the judges and the establishment of the kings along with the captivities and the multiple returns of the Jewish people into their promised land. Section C, Poetry, Five Books, Job through Song of Solomon, grouped more for the type and nature of the content rather than any chronological order. This section is noted for its literary beauty, from the tale of Job's loss turned to triumph, to the songs of the Old Testament saints, to the great thinker Solomon who wrote about the sheer vanity of all things under the sun. Section D, Prophecy, Old Testament, 17 books, Isaiah through Malachi, commonly divided into major prophets, Isaiah through Daniel, and minor prophets, Hosea through Malachi with these designations based on the length of their respective messages. Note, Lamentations is smaller than several of the so-called minor prophets, yet it sequentially falls within the major prophets and has a direct association with the major prophet Jeremiah. These 17 books center around the captivities and restoration of God's chosen people, the Jews. Much of its content has been fulfilled in part and will find a complete fulfillment when God restores the Jewish people. Sometime following the rapture of the church age saints, God will turn his attention back to the nation of Israel. 
Basic Book Divisions 1, New Testament chart on page 39. New Testament Book Divisions, Section E, The Gospels, Four Books, Matthew through John, covering approximately 33 years of events, commencing with the conception of John the Baptist and ending with the final ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ back into heaven. Although the specific themes vary in each of the gospel books, they serve the general purpose of presenting the person and overall work of the Lord Jesus Christ amongst the Jews. Among other details, this section chronicles Christ's baptism, his ministry, his calling and equipping of twelve disciples, later called apostles, his betrayal, his unjust crucifixion, his triumphant resurrection, and his final ascension back to the Father in heaven. Section F, the Acts of the Apostles, one book, Acts, commencing with the time period immediately preceding Christ's ascension back into heaven, which aligns with the final event recorded in the previous section. The book of Acts concludes with Paul's imprisonment in Rome. The book chronicles the acts or actions of the apostles, similar to how the Old Testament books of 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles cover the acts of the kings. It spans approximately 40 years, purposefully majoring upon the historical record. The nature of this book necessitates its standing alone, especially because of its transitional nature, i.e. Peter to Paul, Jew to Gentile, signs to those signs, etc., much of the applicable doctrine and practical instructions taught during this period are more extensively covered in the epistles following the book of Acts. However, not every church practice found in the book continues throughout the epistles. Note, although the purpose of the book of Acts primarily serves a historical record, remember that all scripture is profitable for doctrine, 2 Timothy 3.16. As with any application, the reader's crucial starting point when reading Acts involves considering by whom and to whom and at what time the doctrine was being conveyed. Most false teachers, religious sects, and cults have ignored this important study feature to the detriment of themselves and those whom they influence. Section G, the Epistles, 21 books, Romans through Jude, containing the vast majority of the doctrinal practical teachings received by the early church. While it is true that these teachings directly applied to churches and individuals living during the first century, the doctrines and practical instruction were intended to apply to saints for the duration of the church age. It is important to note that the majority of the teachings within this section were specifically given to the Apostle Paul for the church. In fact, by design, his name is the first word in the first 13 epistles in this section which are combined together to focus the reader on the truths taught therein. Check it out by reading the first word in the book of Romans through Philemon in a King James Bible. Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle, not of men. Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul and apostle of Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul and Sylvanius and Timotheus. 2 Thessalonians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul and Sylvanius and Timotheus. 1 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, Paul and apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God. 2 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, Paul and apostle of Jesus Christ. Titus 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a servant of God. Philemon 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Note, this section of 21 epistles has often been further divided and classified into the epistles and the general epistles with a single division placed between the books of Philemon and Hebrews. Not only does this division create potential misconceptions, but it is wholly inaccurate. An epistle is a general epistle when addressed to a general audience. John's second and third epistles do not match this description. Unfortunately, any rigid application of this classification creates additional problems. For instance, unfortunately, any rigid application of this classification creates additional problems. For instance, those who indiscriminately apply the rule to the so-called general epistles like Hebrews sometimes claim that the book of Hebrews through Jude lack much specific application to Christians in the church age. 
This man-made philosophy has unfortunately hindered Christian growth and maturity. Furthermore, some teachers have formulated these two designations in order to de-emphasize the application for the church, those writings outside the 13 epistles that begin with Paul's name, Romans through Philemon. Obviously, this type of error ultimately leads to the teaching that the books following Philemon contain far less significance for believers than God intended. The entire 21 epistles should be classified more by their general or specific audience to whom each epistle is addressed. The point is that a general audience epistle is addressed to a broader audience. Yet 3 John, addressed under the well-beloved Gaius, reveals a more specifically defined audience. Thus, the more appropriate designation would be a division between the epistles and the general epistles as follows. The epistles include Romans through Hebrews, along with 2 John and 3 John, whereas the general epistles include James through 1 John and Jude. These 21 epistles are where the church finds its primary doctrine, practice, and purpose. This does not mean that variations in these epistles do not exist based upon the audience receiving the epistle. The next verse could explain why God led Paul to write the book of Hebrews to the Jewish Christians in the early church and not designate it with his customary style found in all his other 13 epistles. 1 Corinthians 9.20 And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. Footnote 1 Discussion and explanation of Pauline authorship of Hebrews will be covered at length in later chapters. We know that God designated Paul as a chosen vessel to bear his name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, Acts 9.15. According to Paul, he fashioned his behavior according to the audience he was attempting to influence. In the case of his writing the book of Hebrews, it is obvious that his target audience was uniquely Jewish in nature. Unfortunately, the most extreme dispensational teachings tend to equate Paul's explicit graciousness as expressed in the previous verse as only applicable during his Acts missionary journeys. This contradicts not only the immediate context, but also what Paul had expressed in the previous chapter of 1 Corinthians. This is a key issue with those who hyperdivide the Bible. Too much of the Bible is relegated to the chopping block. Some of these same hyperdispensationalists discount many other teachings in Paul's earliest epistles, like baptism and the Lord's Supper. Yet Paul offers an enduring commitment to put others first, something lacking far too often amongst those who claim to be the most Bible literate. In Paul's own words, within the same context, he said he would use all means to save some. That's found in 1 Corinthians 9.22. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Paul could certainly have classified authoring Hebrews as attempting to reach the Jews by all means. This is especially true since Hebrews does not contradict any of Paul's other teachings, including the proclamation of eternal security, Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. The hyperdispensationalist wants to limit Paul's gracious behavior to the Jews as only applicable to the Acts period. But God ensured that this type of spiritual infidelity could be easily exposed. For example, Paul was no longer bound by the law to eat only certain meats, Yet consider the extent to which Paul said he would go to reach his brethren. 1 Corinthians 8.13 Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Paul said he would not exercise his rights as long as the world standeth, if it would offend his weaker brother. The responsibility for souls and charitable living transcended the Acts period, and only the selfish and self-centered would want this truth limited to the past. According to this verse, did Paul commit to become as a Jew only during the Acts period? Or was Paul willing to abstain from meats that were forbidden under the law until the Lord's return? The way a person answers that question reveals the individual is a Bible believer or a Bible rejecter. Section H, Prophecy, New Testament, One Book, Revelation. Beginning with letters to seven first century literal New Testament churches and culminating at the commencement of eternity future. 
Although seldom considered by most Bible teachers, Revelation is very much a historical book. Revelation begins with a historical record of messages delivered to seven churches and then describes the history of John's reception of the Revelation. Finally, it describes future history as it chronicles end-time events. The focus of Revelation is not so much on instruction of practical truths, but more on the past, present, and future unfolding of events. Another perspective. The next chart of the New Testament shows another basic division of the books of the New Testament. Its layout also closely correlates to that of the Old Testament with the three divisions of historical, practice, and prophetic. The chart found on page 44 is titled Basic Book Divisions to New Testament. Notice the similarities of the New Testament layout to the Old Testament layout with three divisions of historical, practice, and prophetic. The next chart on page 45 is Basic Book Divisions to Old Testament. Timeline Restrictions It is important to recognize the inherent difficulties of placing books of the Bible on a timeline, which by its nature is restrictive. Many of the books of the Bible contain overlapping and transitional features that a finite timeline simply cannot adequately illustrate. As has already been stated, much of the Bible contains prophecy covering periods of thousands of years ahead of its initial revelation recording. In addition to these complexities, more prophecy finds its fulfillment fragmented. The prophecy has a partial fulfillment in the past with a completed fulfillment yet to come in a future time. There are also many instances of dual fulfillment, past and future. Footnote number two. There are many examples of Bible prophecies which have their complete fulfillment in the long term while exhibiting a short-term partial fulfillment. For example, Moses writes of a prophecy of a nation from far which God would send against Israel if they forsook him, Deuteronomy 28:49. The fulfillment of this verse takes place with the Assyrians, Isaiah 5:26, Isaiah 33:19, Hosea 8:1. Babylonians, Jeremiah 4.13, Jeremiah 5.15, as well as Rome, Luke 21.24. Thus, a book of the Bible may be placed upon the chart in the Old Testament, but have content, especially concerning prophecy, yet to be fulfilled far into the New Testament. In such cases, each book shows up on the timeline, period, giving precedence to when it was revealed rather than when the prophecy will be realized. Chart on page 46 is titled Old Testament Timeline. Book Division Timing. Section A, the Pentateuch, approximately 4000 B.C. to approximately 1500 B.C. The Old Testament records God's dealings predominantly with the Jews and through the Jews. The Pentateuch is no exception to that fact. However, the first 11 chapters of Genesis cover a time frame prior to the formation of the Jewish nation through the calling out of Abram. Note, although the authors stand by the previous statement, it should be noted that Abram was called in Hebrews Genesis 14, 13, likely tying him back to his great-great-great-great-grandfather Eber, Genesis 11, 14 through 17, or Heber, Luke 3, 35. The book of Genesis also speaks of the wanderings of the patriarch, the Jewish fathers, ending with their settling in the land of Egypt. The remainder of this section chronicles Israel's deliverance from Egypt, along with their journey to the land of promise. Specific emphasis in this section is placed upon the provision of laws or commandments to be obeyed by the Jewish nation upon entering the land. Section B, History, approximately 1500 B.C. to approximately 500 B.C., this section begins with one man, Joshua, leading a mostly united nation into the land of promise. It ends with one woman, Esther, risking her life to spare a remnant of that same nation while being held captive within a heathen land. The nation repeatedly ignored God's laws, mentioned in the previous section, resulting in their ultimate demise. As they rejected the God that brought them into the land, they turned to the idols that had been the root cause for removal of the land's previous inhabitants. Just as God warned, their rebellion led him to give both the northern Israel and the southern Judah kingdoms into the hands of their enemies. This section covers their captivities in detail. 
Also of notable interest, section A to section B has no overlap, although the Pentateuch does continue. Section B to section D overlaps by approximately 300 years. This overlap will be further explored with the details of section D. Section C, poetry, no defined charitable time element. Section D, prophecy, Old Testament, approximately 800 BC to approximately 400 BC. For approximately 500 years, Israel as one united nation dwelt within the promised land. Solomon's collecting of pagan wives and his compromise with idolatry and the worship of false gods caused the kingdom to be divided into two kingdoms following Solomon's death. It split into the ten northern tribes and two southern tribes. The southern kingdom, Judah, retained a king from David's lineage while the northern kingdom, Israel, was not ruled by a descendant of David. Unfortunately, both kingdoms were forced into captivity because they rebelled against God. Israel suffered the Assyrian captivity, while Judah found itself in the Babylonian captivity. In advance of their respective captivities, God in his grace sent prophets to warn of the impending judgment. These warnings were mostly ignored. For instance, Amos and Hosea were sent to Israel, while Obadiah, Joel, Isaiah, Micah, Nahum, Zephaniah, and Habakkuk were sent to Judah. During their captivities, God sent Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. These prophets were sent to exhort the people to warn of immediate judgment and to promise deliverance. God used Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi to minister during and after each return of the Jews to the land to help them to become reestablished. Many of the prophecies in this section spoke of immediate deliverance taking place at the time of their writings. Their partial fulfillment indicated the deeper prophetic nature of the writings. These writings pointed forward to the work that God's Son would accomplish in both His first and second coming to earth. Note, this section contains frequently misapplied promises usurped by those attempting to assimilate the Jewish promises into the New Testament church. God will fulfill His promises with those to whom He made them, the future believing Israel. A lack of spiritual understanding in this matter has led to confusion, error, and even heresies. Continued ignorance will simply lead to increased confusion, additional error, and further heresies. Section E, Gospels, approximately 5 B.C. to approximately A.D. 29. The four Gospels are the first books of the New Testament. These books follow the 39 Old Testament books and the roughly 400 years of silence from God. The books of Matthew through John cover a period of time of approximately 33 years, overlapping each other in content more so than any other section of Scripture. They end with the ascension of Jesus Christ, the same event which kicks off the book of Acts. Note, 5 B.C. has been used to recognize the perceived errors in the calendar dating system. The chart on page 48 is titled The First Century Record. The four books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are both logically and theologically grouped together as a unit. For this reason, the four gospel books should be studied together as a unit. However, it should be noted that there is an obvious division between the synoptic gospels, that is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and the gospel of John. Although there are likely many reasons for this distinction, John's gospel was written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. John 20, 31. Note, John is the only writer that has a book in three of the four New Testament sections, with Luke as the only writer with a book in two of the four sections. Section F, Acts, approximately A.D. 29 to A.D. 64. The book of Acts follows the Gospel of John. As has been previously discussed, the book of Acts serves primarily as a historical and transitional book. It begins with the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, the last major event recorded in the Gospels, Luke 24, verse 51. The last half focuses upon Paul's missionary journeys and ends with the Apostle Paul in a Roman prison. As a historical book, Acts sets forth the actions of the apostles. Every diligent Bible student quickly notices that the book of Acts is not primarily a book of doctrine, but predominantly historical in nature. As a transitional book, Acts transitions from the Gospels covering the Lord Jesus Christ, Peter, and the other eleven apostles ministering primarily to the Jews, to Paul and his writings. It is very important to notice 
that the book of Acts features a definite and defined transition from one primary spokesman, Peter, to another, Paul. The chart on page 49 is titled Transition from Peter to Paul. As alluded to in Luke 22:32, Peter became the obvious leader of the apostles. The earliest chapters of the book of Acts further demonstrate Peter's leadership role in the church's embryonic stages. Following Acts chapter 12, the complete shift in prominence and focus from Peter to Paul becomes quite pronounced. This point is critical for understanding the Bible. For instance, Peter's name appears a total of 58 times in Acts, but only once after Acts chapter 12, Acts 15, 7. Even this occurrence in Acts chapter 15 shows Peter supporting the ministry of the Apostle Paul. On the other hand, Saul, whose name is changed to Paul, appears 157 times in Acts, with 141 of these occurrences after Acts chapter 12. Section G, the Epistles, approximately A.D. 40 to approximately A.D. 95. The 21 Epistles were authored by five men, with the bulk of their writing being the work of the Apostle Paul, obviously via the Holy Ghost, 1 Corinthians 2.13. 17 of these Epistles begin with the name of the author. Interestingly, John did not use his name in his Epistles or his Gospel. The book of Hebrews uniquely stands apart from the other books in this section, which will be discussed later in this work. These epistles take the church from its infancy all the way to the throne in heaven, providing doctrine, practical instruction for its purification all along the way. Ephesians 5, 25-27 Many of the epistles begin with doctrinal teaching, followed by the practical execution of the doctrines taught. The life of the church parallels the life of an individual. In infancy... The church operated with signs and wonders required by the Jews, but later blossomed into the abiding strengths of faith, hope, and charity. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. The chart on page 50 is titled New Testament Timeline. Section H, Prophecy, New Testament, approximately A.D. 33 to eternity. This section is divided into three parts on the timeline because it contains relevant content covering three distinct periods. The Church Age, Revelation chapters 1, 3 through 4, 1. Daniel's 70th week, Revelation chapters 4 through 18. And the Second Coming, Kingdom, and Eternity Future, Revelation chapters 19 through 22. The first three chapters of Revelation contain letters to seven churches similar to epistles sent by Paul and the other apostles to churches, although the Revelation letters are very short. The fourth chapter sets forth John's rapture into heaven to receive additional revelation, also representing a wonderful picture of the church's rapture and its presence in heaven prior to the onset of any part of Daniel's 70th week, commonly called the tribulation period. Revelation chapters 5 through 18 expound upon the persecution of the Jews especially and the outpouring of Satan's wrath. As it was in the days of Job, the devil and man will only be able to do to the Jews that which God permits. Therefore, the wrath depicted in these chapters is ultimately God's wrath. At that time, God's attention and his prophetic plan again focused upon the Jews. No replacement theology here. Revelation chapter 19 chronicles the return of Christ with his armies. At this return, the Jews will be judged. This judgment is described in Ezekiel 20, verses 34 through 38. At this judgment, the Lord will plead with the Jews face to face, Ezekiel 20, verses 35 and 36. And the timing is clear. I will bring you out from the people. I will gather you out of the countries wherein you are scattered, Ezekiel 20, verse 34. Those who are found to be rebels will be purged, Ezekiel 20, verse 38, and those who have exercised faith in the Lord's reveal of truth will be brought into the bond of the covenant, Ezekiel 20, verse 37, and ushered into the land, so fulfilling the promise that all Israel shall be saved. And that's found in Romans 11:26. And so all Israel shall be saved, as is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. All this happens in fulfillment of God's covenant with the nation of Israel. Unfortunately, some teachers find themselves upon spiritually shaky ground with their incorrect teachings concerning Israel's salvation. They have been taught to believe that 
all Israel shall be saved, infers that God indiscriminately considers all those claiming to be Israel are in fact Israel. Yet God delineates Israel's constituency, and it is not all-inclusive. Romans 9, verse 6, Not as though the word of God had taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. <clears throat> the Bible says that not all Israel are of Israel. Regrettably, the spiritual misconceptions do not end there. These same Bible teachers apply passages dealing with physical salvation or deliverance during Daniel's 70th week to the soul's salvation. It is hard to imagine how anyone could apply the next two passages to the soul when the context plainly refers to physical flesh being saved or delivered. Matthew 24, 13, But he that shall endure in the end, the same shall be saved. Matthew 24, 22, And except those days should be shortened, there shall no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. God promised to shorten the days to preserve physical life. If those days during that time are not shortened in some fashion, the Bible says that none of the elect, believing Israel, would be able to physically endure unto the end. The shorter the days, the more that will be saved, that is, spared physically. No flesh during Daniel's 70th week on its own power will be saved, spared, or preserved. None whatsoever. Interestingly, Jeremiah prophesied extensively concerning the physical salvation of Judah and Israel dwelling safely in the land. Jeremiah 23, 5. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Following the second advent, the judgment of the nations, and the judgment of the Jews, Revelation chapter 20 describes the kingdom, the great white throne, and the second death. Finally, the last two chapters of Revelation introduce the new Jerusalem and the beginning of eternity future. That is the end of chapter 2.